Welcome back to CSIS for another episode of Energy Shots. Kevin, here we are again. Good morning, Joseph. Did anything happen this week? You know, there were a few things that happened here at CSIS this week, as well as around the world. Yesterday, you hosted uh, EIA Administrator Tristan Abbey for a public conversation about his role as administrator, his vision for the EIA. Definitely recommend that the audience checks that one out on our website. And uh, you and I also sat together while Jensen Huang, CEO of NVIDIA, spoke here on Wednesday afternoon about American leadership in AI. It was a remarkable, remarkable conversation he had with Dr. Hamry, head of the center. Maybe we can look at that conversation. Yes, uh, we're gonna have a, a short snippet of tape and then let's talk a little bit about the energy part of that conversation. Let's roll it. But let's simplify AI into a fiber load cake. Energy, chips, infrastructure, models, and applications, okay? I just, and let's hand it Kevin across the, uh, to, from, top, from bottom to top. At the lowest level, energy, China has twice the amount of energy we have as a nation. I want to ask about that. Twice as much energy as we have as a nation, and their, our economy is larger than theirs. Makes no sense to me. We also know that one of the most, one of the most important initiatives, one of the most important policies of this administration, and there was the first thing that President Trump said to me when we met, is listen, we need to reindustrialize America. We need to onshore manufacturing again. We need to make, we need to help America make things again. We need to help America make things again. And we heard from Jensen, that's an energy story. It's an energy story for AI. He talked a lot about AI factories, the production of intelligence. Kevin, what was your read on what uh, Jensen Wong had to say there? He gave us a five-layer cake, if you will, a turducken, right? So a, a chicken inside, a duck inside a turkey. Holiday favorite for the opulent set. Mm. Uh, but no, his first layer was energy. Energy before everything. Yeah. To have more of everything else, the other four components, the chips, the infrastructure, the models, and the applications, those are all digital and technical constructs. But energy is the fundamental input to the economic growth. And I, he was also pretty clear that he thought that the policies that discouraged energy production were, were a mistake. He, he made it clear that we needed more energy so that we could have more AI. This is something that you and I have addressed in this show over a series of episodes, thinking about the energy intensity of economic production, the carbon intensity of our energy production. And, and there you heard a comparison to China, which was slightly different from how you and I have talked about it. The lost opportunity of not using energy here to keep manufacturing going in the United States. Um, I think we're going to continue to talk about this, but I was grateful to see in that piece, in that conversation, so much attention to the issues you and I are doing here on Energy Shots. Absolutely. You know what was interesting, though, also, Joseph, is that this, this week we heard from Energy Secretary Chris Wright in a couple of venues. He spoke at the North American Gas Forum and then again at the National Petroleum Council. Mm. And he talked in that context about the importance of electricity, yes, but he also talked about the importance of molecules, process heat for manufacturing mm. things. Uh, so a, a, a different message, also complementary to the message. It all boils down to more energy. But he's, he was talking about molecules. He was pretty, pretty serious about oil and gas production in particular. And we've looked at this before. Remember, we had a chart a couple weeks ago about if we hadn't lost all the manufacturing share that we had in the 1990s, it would have been about a 43 45% uh, additional energy draw today. Let's talk a little bit about how that might have been fueled and, and what's going on now with energy production. Okay, thanks, Joseph. Well, this chart, uh, whoop, here it is. Here it is again. And there it goes. And now it comes back. We're keeping this dynamic. We say it's unscripted. It's unscripted. Uh, okay, so from left to right, we have the top 15 oil and gas producer states. We're talking in terms of BTUs. So we're looking yep. at total output on a thermal basis. Uh, in terms of their Trumpiness, in terms of their two-party popular vote share in the 2024 election, you have three blue producer states, and then the other 12 are red. And if you look at this, mm. these 15 states correspond to about 99% of onshore oil and gas production. Uh, the blue states, while significant producers, are at 17 percentage points of those 99, yep. uh, and then 82 percentage points from the, the red states. Uh, and there, I think there is a couple of takeaways. First of all, it's, you know, it's, this has all gotten very partisan, perhaps too partisan. Yeah. Right? The rocks don't vote. It's the people walking around above them who do. Mm. Uh, neither, for that matter, do the wind or the sun or the rain, to quote the blue oyster cult. <laughs> uh, and so, look, this is, this is really, it's not to overly politicize it, but there are some dynamics in terms of policy that right. can align with the geological or 
energy resource basis of states to facilitate production. When you look at this, this is the cumulative, and Texas here is 37% of that total 99 I was gonna say, I see, I see three margins here that really jump out to me. The first is PA, this is natural gas mostly. Yes. The second is Texas, just an absolute step change in BTUs produced, that's oil and gas. Louisiana, probably also oil and gas because of offshore production. And then you march up into the what we think about as the, the coal states, not included in this graph, but West Virginia and Wyoming topping it all off. Turns out they have fossil resources of another kind as well. Right. Uh, now, so there's, there's a lot of ways to map the significance in terms of sort of how the policy filters mm. through the politics and then the economics and fundamentals. And maybe if we go to the next slide, we can think about this not just in terms of the share of national production, right. which I think is, is still very extremely important, but also the share of state level GDP. So uh, we, are, we are back to the bubble charts, uh, bubble charts being a, a fan favorite, I think. Uh, well, maybe we're back to bubble charts. Here we are. We're working uh, on it. We're working our way forward. Uh, one step forward, two steps back, two steps forward. I wait. Swipe and tap, Kevin. Swipe there we are, tap. swiping we and are. tapping. Okay, good. So on, on the y-axis here, we have now the oil and gas share of state GDP. And here what you see are some fairly significant takeaways. It's easy to think about California as an oil and gas state. It's still a very significant producer. Can but on a GDP basis, we're looking at like 11 basis points mm. of 2024 GDP just from the upstream. Now, we're not counting services. We're not counting pipelines. We're not counting refining. We're not counting coal extraction. We're right. looking just at the oil and gas income as the Bureau of Economic Analysis charts it. Got but it. when we look at 9.1% in New Mexico, this is a very significant, you've got a, you've got a small denominator because mm -hmm. New Mexico is not a very wealthy state, uh, and you have a very large numerator because it's a prolific producer. Uh, but leading the pack here, Alaska, about 8%, mm -hmm. Texas in the 6% range, uh, very significant up here in North Dakota as well. And what you're seeing is that with the exception of New Mexico, it's really that these red states have, a, in a lot of cases, a very significant state leverage, state economic leverage to that production, which would be a reason to structure policies that might favor that production. Right. Now, one thing to, about Louisiana, very big refining state. Yes. Uh, and so when you look at Louisiana, this number doesn't include refining. We'd be up here, you know, much closer, right. maybe even off the top of the chart, if we looked at the refining share of GDP in, in and, Louisiana. And what does the size of the bubble tell us, Kevin, here? Well, that, that takes us back to the previous chart. That was the share of national ah. onshore oil and gas production. So as we on, march up that ladder, basis. there's Pennsylvania, there's Texas, and that's the sort of share of global, of, uh, national oil and uh, onshore yes, oil and gas production. Number one and number two in terms of the BTU uh, and very close number three. Now, the, the other thing I think also, look at these highly diversified economies, right? right? If you think about how big GDP the denominator is in Ohio mm -hmm. and Pennsylvania, even though they're such prolific producers, you actually are still getting a relatively small share. Interesting, all right. So there's a lot of other things to think about here too. So yeah. you have favorable policies, but you also have economic results and outcomes. Uh, and as we look, look sort of retrospectively uh, on a rig count basis, uh, and now what we have is the same ordinal ranking in terms of the Trumpiness, the two-part, uh, the two-party popular vote count, uh, going from from left to right as we did before to the Trumpiest on the right-hand side. Uh, now we're looking at the rig count as Baker Hughes. Uh, computed it last week, just before Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. relative to the year ago. Okay. Uh, so this the is... left hand, lighter blue, is, is, is last year. Uh, this year is the darker blue. Got it. Uh, and uh, as you look ahead, you can see that actually in the blue states, rig counts, these are oil and gas land rig counts, mm -hmm. increased down significantly in Texas, uh, down also in Oklahoma, down in North Dakota, uh, down in West Virginia. Some of the more prolific producers are actually seeing less rig activity, part of that a reflection of lower prices. So in, uh, in, the, in the year 2025, it's drill, baby, drill in blue states, and it's take a step back in red states. Yeah, well, it's, that's how the numbers work out. Now, there's some stories behind the numbers. There is greater productivity of rigs that can yes. obviate the need for rigs. But when you look at the absolute decline here year on year in Texas, that's just less drilling, and that's gonna translate over time, if not immediately, into less production. Interesting. All right, let's look at, we've got one more here. Yeah, well, and so that's the question here too. What do we see in terms of output declines? Uh, and in, it's a mixed story. So California, look, the oil and gas story in California is a decline story. And the EIA's data showing September 25 versus September 24, which is what we have here, mm -hmm. show percentage declines. Now, these are not absolute levels. These are percentage declines, but uh, still significant. New Mexico, robust. Uh, uh, but and then in terms of the, the, the Pennsylvania story uh, on gas, and just to be very clear, uh, what we have here is uh, on, on the crude oil is the darker 
mm. of the of the two bars, yep. and uh, then gross gas withdrawals. The EIA doesn't compute dry gas, net dry gas, right away. So the fastest uh, data point we can get is actually a gross number mm -hmm. that includes the natural gas liquids and other components of right. the gas stream. Got it. Uh, anyway, what you have here, just to get to the cut to the chase, right. is you have a, essentially a mixed story. So yeah. look, there's two takeaways that I think that we're going to get to. One of them, though, is that the red states produce. Yes. The second one, though, is that the blue states, with a couple of exceptions, reduce. Mm. And that probably takes us to the next slide. It does. Um, you know, Kevin, one of the one of the things that's been going on here in Washington from a oh, here we go. Produce and reduce. Yeah. Well, you were saying about Washington. Oh, here in Washington, we are looking at um, the EPA is doing a rulemaking trying to understand the greenhouse gas reporting program. Do they want to revisit it? Do they want to remove it? If you don't intend to regulate greenhouse gases, what value does it bring you? to get emissions reporting from all emitting facilities in the United States above 25,000 uh, tons of CO2 a year. And so we spent a little time this week and over the past few weeks reading the RF, the responses to the EPA's RFI. How is this data used? What In what segments of the economy is it uh, potentially valuable? And then trying to understand the data set itself, right? This is, there's public good associated with the kind of data that the federal government can uh, collect. And so this shows us the, the, the produce story. What we're looking at here is a million metric tons of CO2 equivalent. So the, this database includes CO2, methane, and other greenhouse gases, all equilibrated, all uh, calculated in terms of the CO2 warming effect. Um, across uh, all the states, we're again coloring red versus blue according to the 2024 uh, election. And man, look at Texas, 500 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent coming from everything in this database. Now, what does that include? That includes power plants, refineries, it includes upstream oil and gas facilities. What we're not looking at here is uh, emissions from driving cars or the transportation sector, right. agriculture. These are stationary sources. This, yeah, and what, why I think this is interesting is like, this is kind of production, mm -hmm. right? This is, you know, this is where we're emitting because something is happening that involves exactly the processes Secretary Wright's talking about, what Jensen Huang is talking about, where we're making stuff or doing stuff at a, at a facility, right? A manufacturing or industrial facility. But intuitively, you would expect the nation's largest and most prolific energy producing state to also be the greatest emitting state. Of course. I mean, everything, this is refineries, it is oil and gas production, it is industrial facilities. It's, it's a different way of looking at the weight of the Texas economy in oil and gas production uh, in greenhouse gas emissions. Got it, okay. And then you see that and Texas is just an absolute super performer. Now we can look at it in a similar way to how you were discussing oil and gas production. So we look at this bubble chart here and what are we looking at? On the y-axis, we have the share of emissions from that state, which are accounted in the flight database at EPA. So everybody mm -hmm. who reports into this program, we add them all up by the state. This is for the year 2023. And this is the total share of emissions Okay. That are in that database. So what does that mean? That means compared to the overall emissions from that state. Got it. So if you're above 50% on that line, that means that production emissions, as, as counted in this database, are larger than consumption emissions, okay. roughly speaking. And if you're below this line, that means your consumption emissions are larger than your production emissions, again, roughly speaking. So there, New Mexico stands out as a relatively lower producer of greenhouse gas emissions than it does the economic weight of its oil and gas industry. You've got California, a very large economy, a, small, a relatively small producer in terms of its economic uh, uh, production. And so it, it ranks relatively low on this. What you see, though, is the production of the red states. Texas, Louisiana, West Virginia, Wyoming, all producing more uh, goods and emitting because of that production than they are consuming internally. Wait, so where's that record, record scratch sound we were gonna <laughs> order? Uh, so what you're saying here, Joseph, if I have this correct, is that the, the red states produce and the blue states reduce. I would say that, and in fact, I would say that, yes, there's production here and then reduce, but in, in this reduction, uh, there's, there's emissions associated with this, right? Because that means right. you've got other economic activity driving around, et cetera, that are causing the emissions from those states. So we don't have a complete story. We're looking at part of the story in terms of stationary sources. We're already, yes, this is only stationary sources. So if you're concerned with 
the sort of reindustrialization, reindustrialization of America, if you're concerned with the carbon intensity of production, if you're trying to think about how do you set an economic strategy for the United States, you are drawn to these producing states more than you're drawn to these uh, consuming states. It's a totally different basket of policies and approaches that you want to take which address these kinds of emissions than the consumption emissions in large blue states, which is really about personal consumption. Well, can we go back to that power slide that we uh, skipped over? Yes, we quick? can. Because uh, I think one of the themes that we've been hearing is that the people who've been looking at energy futures have been fundamentally wrong about demand. Hmm. Uh, it's not plateauing anytime soon. It's growing. There's, there's many energy poor countries in the world that want to live like we do. We hear these themes over and over again. But we're also finding that here in the United States, we have energy demand growth that we didn't previously expect. Yep. Uh, but we also have policies in place. And what this chart shows is a, a couple of things. We are now going from the highest share of clean electricity generation in 2024, which is counting non uh, fossil sources, mm -hmm. essentially, so nuclear power, hydro, hydro non-hydro renewables, biomass, geothermal, all in that bucket. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the percentage that is clean by that definition, going from highest to lowest, using the same red-blue mnemonic. And the green dots, the green dots show the states that have renewable portfolio standards programs. Now, these different states have different programs, the different targets. So Texas has a renewable portfolio standard that was quantitative, mm -hmm. uh, they long exceeded, right. right? It doesn't mean that it's, it's a binding standard in the same way that some of the other states do. But there's two takeaways that should be immediately obvious. One is that all of the blue states have green dots. Yep. So there is a policy decision that has been taken to try to clean the mix. The other thing I think that's also clear is that you'll see some red states near the front of the pack, but when you decompose where they are on clean share, and you mm -hmm. ask, where did that come from? In some cases, it's because of prolific wind or yep. very substantial hydroelectric. South uh, Dakota, Idaho, Kansas, absolutely. Iowa, yeah. Uh, but uh, you will also see that there's a lot of red states <laughs> with their green dots uh, that are in the lower end of this pack, with yes. less stringent RPS programs. Now, where does this go? So the question is, are we in a place where these cleaning and greening ideas are in conflict with the supply requirements implied by the demand mm. of today. Uh, and I think the messages that we were getting, and to some degree, I think uh, Jensen Huang was, was absolutely talking about the data center side of the story yep. uh, and, and sort of the, the chip side of the story, uh, but he could not get past the idea for energy supply. Mm. The energy secretary this week also talking very substantially about trying to get supply. Uh, so where do these portfolio standards and other green program, programs stand as we look right. into that more demand intensive supply future? Well, I look forward to digging into that question with you in the future, Kevin, because I think there's lots of ways we can unpack this question. We are at time. I want to thank you so much for all of the time you spent at CSIS with me this week. Uh, viewers do need to check out Kevin's conversation with Tristan because there was some uh, very insightful and somewhat newsy uh, portions of that conversation. And uh, we will be back uh, two weeks from today for a pre-holiday episode of Energy Shots. Hope you have an energetic day. Kevin, thank you so much.